Friends, hello and welcome to another episode of The Legal Breakdown. As always, I am your host, Jason Sansone with Sansone Howell Attorneys at Law. We want to thank our host station, KTLV 1220 AM Terrestrial Radio. You can always listen to this program from 5 to 5.30 p.m. on Wednesdays on KTLV 1220 AM. If you're outside of the reach of KTLV's station, you can listen online through the TuneIn Radio app to KTLV. TLV anywhere in the world that you have internet connectivity. Or, alternatively, you can watch the show live on Facebook Live on the Sansone Howell Facebook page. Not able to listen to the show when it airs live at 5 o'clock on Wednesdays? Well, we record every episode and post those to YouTube.com in video format. And the podcast audio is available on Google Play, Apple's Podcast Directory, and Spotify Podcast. Friends, today we have a very serious topic to talk about. We're going to be talking about protective orders. Specifically in Oklahoma, we call them victim protective orders or VPOs. Now, we're going to talk about it, of course, from both sides, from that of the uh, victim who would be seeking a VPO, as well as from the defendant who has had one filed against them. Let's be honest, not always are VPOs that have filed legitimate. Sometimes they are, in fact, frivolous. And so both sides need to know their rights. Both sides need to know what can be done on this very serious topic. So starting out, let's just talk about point number one. You can file a VPO on your own or, of course, with assistance. It is designed to be very straightforward and simple so that it can be done without the complexity usually involved and needing an attorney. We want to make sure people have access to justice. We want victims to come forward to file these if they are absolutely necessary. By all means, we do not want there to be any barriers, any reason to not do it. So number one, you can do it on your own. You go to the courthouse in your county, it's going to be a state district court, so don't go to a municipal court. So if you live in Dell City, you don't go to Dell City. If you live in Midwest City, you don't go to Midwest City Municipal. In Oklahoma City, you don't go to Oklahoma City Municipal. If you live in Oklahoma County, you would go to Oklahoma County Courthouse. They're going to have all the documents and paperwork there that you need. You can also look them up online. For example, Oklahoma County District Court has very good instructions about this procedure on their website, and they also have the documents you would need. So if you don't want to fill them all out sitting there at the courthouse, you could print them, you could have them ready. One important detail, and they mention this on Oklahoma County's website, don't sign it until you get there. Actually, in fact, I have printed some of the instructions that they have from Oklahoma County. So a couple details I want to make sure people know. Um, If you're going to fill it out and you're not at the courthouse, you need to do it all in black ink. Don't use blue. Don't use some other fun color, green or pink. You need to use black ink. Make sure that you sign it in the presence of the clerks. So don't sign it before you get to the clerk's office. Either the person who is the victim or the defendant, the petitioner or the defendant, one of them has to live in the county in which you are filing. That's the jurisdiction of the case. So make sure that you or the person you're filing against live in, say, Oklahoma County if you're filing it there. They've got some other important details. We're not going to go into every one right now because they're a little more nuanced and outside sort of the scope of what we're going to talk about today. But just minor detail, obviously, is... It's got to be when they're open. You've got to do it during normal business hours. And so if you're filling the documents out beforehand and you're going to bring them, sign them, and file them, hey, not as huge of a deal. You might be able to get there at 4.30, 4.45 because they close at 5. But they do caution you that they recommend being there no later than 3.30 on a regular business day because it can take up to an hour to fill everything out. Now, personally, I think that's a bit of an exaggeration. It shouldn't take you an hour, but I can appreciate why they have that cautionary warning on Oklahoma County clerk's 
website. In addition to the excellent information, by the way, that we're referencing today, and anyone who happens to hear this, and if you ever, and I hope you don't, but if you ever need this kind of information, if you are in a position where you need a VPO, great resources on Oklahoma County, clerk website, court clerk website. In addition, Legal Aid has 20 pages of great information, much of it we're going to talk about in reference today, but LegalAidOK.org, L-E-G-A-L-A-I-D-O-K.org. Legal Aid of Oklahoma has very good information about this topic that will step you through the entire process. So we talked about you're going to fill out the documents for the protective order. You're going to file these at the clerk's Okay, but so what are the grounds? This is where now we're going to start to go through together this petition for protective order. The first thing you need to understand about the petition is there's three broad categories wherein you can seek a victim's protective order. It can be for eminent threat of physical harm, harassment, or stalking. With all of these, you can either have basically no relationship to the person or you can have a specific relationship to the defendant. And those relationships are married, a parent-child relationship, related by marriage, living in the same household, biological parents of the same child, victim of rape, divorced, a person's related by blood, the present spouse of a former spouse, formerly living in the same household, or persons in a previous dating relationship. So what all that means is you've got to identify one of these categories. And if you don't fall into one of these categories then unfortunately the problem is that a VPO is only available if you are a victim of stalking. So, and it says this in very big, bold print on the front of this, if you do not fall into one of the above relationships, then a victim's protective order is only available if you're a victim of stalking. If you meet one of these other categories, then you can use harassment or eminent threat of bodily injury. If you are a victim of stalking and you do not have a relationship to the individual, this is a very important point, which again is also pointed out very clearly in the petition form, then you must also have already filed a complaint with law enforcement related to the stalking. You must attach to the petition a police report about this stalking before seeking the VPO to cut down on frivolous allegations of stalking. So you don't have to have a police report for stalking if you have a relationship to them. You don't have to claim stalking if you have a relationship to them. But if you have no relationship whatsoever, based on those nine categories I read off a moment ago, or actually, sorry, 11 categories I read off a moment ago, no relationship got to make sure you're, you're claiming stalking, and you've got to make sure you have the police report beforehand. Okay. Well, we touched on jurisdiction already. That's the next paragraph two of this petition. Make sure you're filing it in the proper jurisdiction. If you live in Oklahoma County and the defendant lives in Oklahoma County, don't go file in Cleveland County. That's not going to make sense. Okay. Well, then you're going to, in essence, spend describe the incident. And this is where probably the most time is involved and where very understandably can be the most emotional. To the best of your ability, spell out very clear facts. Don't use pronouns, indefinite pronouns especially. Don't say he or she. Use exact names. Try to use dates. Try to use locations. Describe the actions that were taken by the alleged defendant. Because here's the deal. You want the judge to see what it is they're going to be granting a VPO for. 
When you file these, you can ask for a emergency temporary protective order. Typically you do. You don't have to, but to be honest, it's somewhat illogical that the harm is of a nature that we need a VPO and that you don't want a EPO, an emergency protective order. Well, that EPO is not going to be granted if you don't put enough information in there that on its face the judge believes there is need for the protective order. So make sure you come armed with good information, that you have the facts contained in there. If necessary, if possible, attach additional pages. So I touched on it already, but now as we work through this together, when you get to paragraph 5, it asks, Petitioner does request an emergency ex parte order because it's necessary to protect the petitioner from immediate and present danger of domestic abuse, stalking, or harassment, or you do not seek an emergency ex parte protective order, but does request the relief after notice and hearing in a final order. Now, like I said, it is possible to ask for a final protective order, but not an emergency protective order. As an attorney, in my opinion, I would probably always tell someone to ask for an emergency protective order. One, because you need to protect yourself. And two, because I don't think you're setting up the best foot forward with a judge if we're saying, well, it's not so bad that I need protection now. It's okay. I can wait. But I'm going to need protection later. If the harm is real, the harm is real now, and the harm will be real later, and you need to ask for that protective order. Another thing that's I want to touch on, and, and I think Legal Aid makes a very good point of this as well on their website, should anyone ever reference or read Legal Aid's website. And it actually says exactly this, while protection orders can help keep you safe, they are only pieces of paper and you must take other steps to protect yourself. They couldn't have said it more succinctly or better. That is not to diminish this process. You should 100% seek a protective order if you are ever the victim of violence, domestic abuse, harassment, stalking. But you also need to be aware that this in and of itself is not the only thing you should tentatively do. That like everything, the security, the, the steps necessary need to be in balance with the threat. And so if someone is harassing you but has never threatened you, you don't believe that they are going to conduct violence against you, well, then that's understandable and maybe we don't need to go to extremes. If, on the other hand, you are in an incredibly abusive relationship and this person has already caused you great bodily harm, they have threatened to do it again in the future, or they may have even threatened to end your life, then please do not just get this piece of paper without taking other steps. There are shelters, there are ways to be anonymous, there's ways to hide if someone is trying to find you, um, to have security, but unfortunately, you know, the statistics are real. People who have had VPOs have had them violated, and we're going to get to what the ramifications for violating a VPO are. They're very severe, but that doesn't mean that it can't occur. There are people who have unfortunately been murdered, who had victims protective orders against the person that committed the murder. It's a very serious topic, folks. Please make sure that in addition to these steps, you have other necessary steps, either including law enforcement, uh, battered shelters, um, whatever that might be. And we're going to talk about some of this harm in a minute, because when seeking relief in the protective order, there's different categories of what you're asking for, and those are, in my opinion, needing to be balanced with the risk of the harm. So we want to make sure we keep that in perspective. So we talked about the fact you can get this filed. Typically, the court date, the hearing, is going to be within 20 days of when you file it. After it's filed, the sheriffs will have it served on the respondent, the defendant. You do not have to serve it yourself. You do not need to let them know where you live. You don't have to get anywhere near them. We mentioned that it's important to protect yourself. Oh, by the way, at the time of filing, there are no court costs. There is no expense to file one of these at the time of filing. We mentioned there, we don't want any barriers 
to seeking relief. So don't allow economics to be a consideration here. There's no court cost to file it. No one else can file it for you, though. Be aware of that. A police officer can't do it. You have to do it. Um, but, but, I want you to be aware, the court can later assess the normal costs and filing fees if it's found to have been frivolous, so if the person who filed it shouldn't have ever filed it, or if the defendant then has a protective order granted against them, they will sometimes assess costs against the defendant. They can assess them against either party. It's up to the judge to based on the facts. So I'm not, again, dissuading anyone from filing a VPO under real circumstances, but please don't use these as another form of abuse or harassment. That if you are just in a drama-filled, contested relationship and you want to get back at someone using courts, is not appropriate unless you have real grounds. So filing a frivolous VPO could end you up in a little trouble and possibly have some costs associated with that. So you're going to go to this hearing, okay? When you go to the hearing, if you are the defendant, you may want to obtain counsel. If you are the petitioner, some counties have services where you can have legal counsel for free at the courthouse, Oklahoma County being one, that typically on a docket for victims protective orders, there are attorneys there who will offer free services to the petitioner, but there are not free services for the defendant. If you have one filed against you, you may wish to quickly engage counsel. We mentioned that these come up within 20 days from the date of when you're served, so you need to get on it quickly. Both sides need to come armed with evidence. You need to have obtained the police report if possible or relevant if there is one. Now, remember, there may not be a police report. You don't have to have a police report. You don't have to have engaged law enforcement whatsoever, and that won't be held against you. It is entirely possible for domestic abuse or, or other forms of victim violence to occur, and law enforcement have never been involved. Maybe they should have been, but doesn't mean they always are. So if they were have that information. If there's tax, if it's harassment, if there's stalking, have whatever communications available printed out ready for the court to see, to view. Documents, evidence, information is always better than just blanket statements, but that doesn't mean you don't want to tell your story. You do. You need to have your version, your narrative prepared and ready. And as we already mentioned, just like when you're filling out the petition, do your very best to describe things with specificity and accuracy. Don't have he, then, they have a statement. Around 10 p.m. on July the 4th, after a long day of drinking over Independence Day, my now ex-husband, John, came over to my house. He kicked down the door. Those are the types of exact information that you should try to convey to the court. We do want to remind everyone that this show, we have the ability to call in live. I forgot to mention it at the beginning of the program today, so I'll mention it again, that if you're listening and you have any questions on either side of this topic, from a petitioner or a defendant standpoint, you can call at 405-347-7238. Eight. Um, I will see that. Also, you can ask questions through the social media if you're watching this live on Facebook. On the Facebook Live video, you can ask your questions through that. That's available. But so we were talking about the steps. Let's back up. Let's reiterate everything. You're either going to prepare everything before you go to the courthouse or you're going to fill it out at the courthouse. Don't sign it unless you're in front of the clerk, though, either way, because they need to see you sign it. You're going to only fill it out in black. You're going to want to make sure that you are at your county court clerk sometime in their normal business hours, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. You're going to come armed with evidence and facts when you go to your hearing. You're not going to have to serve it. Law enforcement is going to do that. You're not going to have to pay anything when you file it. That will very likely be waived, and you won't ever have to pay anything, presuming that you're not filing a frivolous case. We talked about have evidence. Haven't touched on yet, but make sure you have your witnesses if they exist. 
Oftentimes, unfortunately, there are no witnesses. These types of things tend to occur in private um, without anyone else. Only the two parties involved may know. That doesn't mean, though, that if there are witnesses, you don't want to bring them. You do. Friends, family, children, if there was violence, um, if you can get a doctor, an emergency room nurse, whoever maybe the first responders are. Now, I want to touch on something real fast just because I have personally seen it. I actually interned in Dallas at the Family Violence Unit for the Dallas County District Attorney's Office. So I have pretty intimate knowledge about this topic, not just in our state, but in Texas. And it is unfortunate, but with great frequency, abusers learn how to abuse and how to do it so that it doesn't leave evidence. Folks, the fact that you can't prove a bruise or a mark obviously doesn't mean it didn't happen, and our judges know that as well. So please don't think that just because I don't have this photo or I can't have an x-ray of a broken arm doesn't mean that they don't know that you may not have been battered, that there wasn't violence. Tell the story your credibility will come through. I, I hate that it has to be said, but it does have to be said that just because things don't show doesn't mean there wasn't violence. In addition, just because violence isn't physical doesn't mean it can't be emotional or psychological. That's why these cover a range of eminent, throttle, eminent bodily injury in addition to harassment or stalking. So it can cover quite the spectrum. So now let's shift gears to the what, of course, are you asking for? What is it you want with the victim's protective order? So in the petition, you're going to ask for the relief requested. What are we trying to have done? Most common, most obvious, item number one is the defendant should be prohibited from having any contact whatsoever with the petitioner. I'd be surprised if there's ever one of these files where that's not requested. That's, of course, the point is to protect yourself, to have no contact. Defendants should be prohibited from injuring, abusing, sexually assaulting, molesting, harassing, stalking, or threatening the petitioner. Okay, that's number two. And we're going to run through these because I really want to go through them and make sure everyone understands these different things. Number three, the defendant should be prohibited from engaging in other contact that would place the petitioner in reasonable fear of bodily injury. Number four, the defendant should be ordered to leave and remain away from the residence located at, and then you would fill it out. So if you cohabitate together, if you live together, you can ask that the defendant not be allowed to reside there with you so that you can have a stable, stable safe place of residence away from your abuser. You can ask for that. You can ask the court to order law enforcement to accompany the defendant to the residence to remove their necessary clothing and personal effects and to remain in attendance until the defendant leaves the residence. And the court should further order the defendant not to go to the above residence to remove necessary clothing unless accompanied by law enforcement. So you can ask that they be escorted any time they come to and from the place you're living, if you are living together, for your safety and protection. That's number five. Number six, you can ask that law enforcement accompany you as opposed to the defendant. So let's say that you move out or you've been out, but you need to go back and get your things, but you don't feel safe there. You can ask that you have law enforcement assist you with that. You can say that there's an existing child visitation order in effect and that it should be suspended or modified temporarily to protect from threats of abuse or violence. Now, like a lot of things, unfortunately, these can get very complicated. These can deal with issues that intermix with divorces. They intermix with paternity, custody. A VPO in and of itself is never going to replace other legal actions. All this can do is the things I'm reading to you, which are to protect you to allow certain forms of safety and security. It is not, though, going to be a, a substitute for a modification to a custody order for the division of property, for example. Just because you have the ability to take some things out of the home 
doesn't mean we may not still need to have distribution of marital assets with a divorce. It doesn't mean that if you are in a non-marital relationship and you have property together, there's not going to need some court order for the distribution of that. So remember, this isn't the end all. It's about your safety and protection. There may be other forms of relief necessary. We've got five minutes left, so I want to keep going and get through some of this. If animals are involved, you can ask for certain things involving their protection or no contact. You can ask that an individual be forced to obtain domestic abuse, counseling, or treatment. You can actually, now this is where we get, I don't want to say super severe, but this is important. If we are talking about majorly harmful relationships, and I mentioned that a piece of paper in and of itself does no good, right? It's just a piece of paper. It only matters if the person respects it. Well, then I think when we get to 11, we're really ratcheting it up. You can actually ask for GPS monitoring of the defendant. Now, is the court going to grant this immediately in all circumstances? Of course, that's a pretty severe requirement that on emergency protective order, we are asking that they have to have an ankle monitor to know whether they're coming near you. I would say be ready to be armed with the facts. Have there been prior VPOs? Have those VPOs been violated previously? Um, or alternatively, you know, what was the level of harm? If he puts you in the hospital and he's threatened to do it again and you can document that, a GPS ankle monitor 24-7 location is very much justified. But, you know, we're getting into the, the higher categories. Um, number 13, I think, is probably one of the most important should the defendant be required to surrender firearms or other dangerous weapons in their possession? If they are known to have firearms and you have been threatened with them, absolutely, you should ask for this form of relief and as a form of protection. Now, again, if you're the defendant and you don't believe that this was justified, you're going to have your day in court. That if you have a temporary emergency protective order granted against you, it does not mean it's a permanent order. That's where your time and place at the hearing is going to come out. That's when the court can grant a permanent hearing or a permanent order, which can be in effect for up to four years. If at the end of the four years you still believe it necessary, there's ways to have these extended. There's also ways to have them shortened. There's also ways to have this expunged. We don't have the time today to go into all those details, and maybe we may do that in a future program. But if you have a protective order denied, and you had it filed against you, there's things you can do to get that wiped off your record and have the court record sealed. There's still some ways that even if it's granted long down the road, you possibly could have it expunged. So those are some things to look at. And then, of course, you can ask that the defendant be ordered to pay the court costs. Um, and if you, as the petitioner, have attorney's fees, you can ask that those attorney's fees be paid. Let's try to wrap up a little bit. We've got two minutes left. At the end of the petition, it gives you some very serious warnings that I've already talked about, which is that you should not file these frivolously or baselessly, and that it is against the law to do so for the purposes of harassment or taking advantage or intimidating, especially if it's involving child visitation rights or part of a divorce. So, like I said, please use it wisely, use it correctly, don't use it abusively. So now, lastly, what happens if you violate a VPO? Well, the first violation in Oklahoma is a criminal misdemeanor punishable uh, up to a year in jail and a thousand dollar fine. Second violation is a felony. And the second time it is violated, um, then you could be incarcerated for much, much longer. It doesn't matter if there's any physical harm on the second violation, no matter what second violation of a VPO can be a felony, folks. So that's where statistics show and good information on Legal Egg's website that a lot of times these are effective, that they can cut down and they can stop the violence, but it is not, that's not a guarantee. That's why we tell you don't use it exclusively. Make sure you ask for all the necessary relief. Make sure you take other steps to protect yourself by all means. We also have a blog on this topic on the Sansone Howell website, S-A-N-S-O-N-E-H-O-W-E-L-L.com. It's going to 
write out sort of succinctly everything that we talked about today. So we've given you three places to find excellent information other than the video or audio we've talked about here today. You can go to Oklahoma County Court Clerk's website where you can find these forms and you can find information. You can go to LegalAidOK.org excellent long information and you can call legal aid and ask them in addition uh, for assistance should you need their assistance real fast i want to read their phone number off 405-521-1302 one more time folks legal aid of oklahoma 405-521-1302 i've run long this has been the legal breakdown with jason sansone folks stay warm have a great week